Hello and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And I am so thrilled that we finally have Dan Fitzgerald onto the podcast, author and friend of the show and all around wonderful person, spicy writer. I don't, I don't, I can keep, I can keep thinking of things to introduce you with, but. It is an honor, a thrill of a lifetime to be on. Well, you can't say that because then what are you going to say for the next time you're on? Uh, That's true. You've run yourself into a corner here. (laughs) Well, we'll have to find a way to make it even more exciting. All right. I'm sure we can. Well, let's get started with something great that happened recently. Sarah, I'm going to pick on you and make you start. (laughs) I can do that because I actually have my good thing prepared for once. I recorded the Wheel of Time panel for the SFF Addicts podcast, uh, which will already be out by the time that this episode comes out. So you should go and listen if you are interested in hearing a bunch of us discuss Wheel of Time. It was a lot of fun, as it always is when I'm on that podcast. Am I a bad cousin if I don't listen? (laughs) I wasn't (laughs) expecting you to listen. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> I will definitely be listening. In fact, I just uh, retweeted it earlier today. It was exciting to see. See, you're my new cousin, Dan. Yeah, I've, I've been replaced. <laughs> I'm disowning Lily. <laughs> I accept this. Well, Dan, other than uh, becoming the new cousin, what's something great that happened this week? Um, well, I got a, a video trailer for uh, my next book, The Isle of a Thousand Worlds. So I'm excited to, to share that this weekend. And there was something else. Something non-bookish. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't recall what that might have been. (laughs) So (laughs) must have been really great. This is me not paying attention to anything. I know Isle of a Thousand Worlds. You just said the title. That was, did I get it? Yes. Yes. Uh, That is the sequel for the book we're discussing today. Yes. I did not realize it wasn't out yet because we got a sneaky sneak peek. Uh, (laughs) That's my bad. Well, That's by the exciting. time this episode air- airs, it will be out, of course. Okay, excellent. If it comes out this Saturday, so three days from now. Well. And you're a good thing, Lily? Oh, yeah. I always forget me. I shouldn't be the one doing this. <laughs> I've actually had a lot of great things happen, so I am going to pick the most irrelevant one, which is I painted my nails for the first time in like a month. That's always exciting. Let's Let's see them. Got a little cactus on them. Yeah. Wow. It's a stamp. I'm not actually good at painting my nails. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something, it's just the most trivial thing that serves no purpose other than making me smile. So it's nice. I miss painting my nails. I used to do it a lot. And then I started a podcast and had no time. <laughs> Couldn't you paint your nails while podcasting? Judging by how coherent I am when I'm trying to pay attention. I'm not sure that adding another distraction would be a good idea. Fair enough. Plus, I think you probably wouldn't want to paint your nails while drinking. Well, maybe you would. I don't know. I've never painted my nails. That's how I paint my nails. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you wouldn't want to paint your nails not drinking. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's been it's been a really nice beginning of the year. And it's going to be a really nice, well, I was going to say rest of the year. Dan, you're wonderful. I'm not sure if your appearance on our podcast is quite enough to make the entire year excellent. (laughs) I want to leave some space for some garbage to happen in the world. (laughs) Definitely a good rest of January. There we go. Dan. Yes, it's going to be a busy January as well. Yeah, well, you have your second, well, your second book of this series coming out. Yes. And then then I'm going to be on TBR Con panel as well, uh, which is very exciting. Oh, when is that? It's uh, end of January. I think mine is on the 28th. And that's on romantic fantasy? Correct. Which I was flabbergasted when I was asked to join. Uh, <laughs> but very excited, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, anyway, some some exciting people are on there. And I think uh, maybe Crystal might even be uh, moderating that. So, Well, I'm less flabbergasted. <laughs> I think that makes quite a bit of sense. It's going to be a good panel. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. And then another secret panel later on this year, but that's separate. Oh, we won't, we won't ask. We'll just make faces at you. We'll find out soon enough. Okay. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Well, before we dive into the living waters like that, and you like that pun, is that a pun or just a joke? I think it's just a joke. Not everything is a pun. What's everyone drinking tonight? (laughs) I am drinking Blindwood Cider. 
they are wonderful and hand delivered again. Drew just had a baby, their second child, at the end of December. And what variety is this? Blindwood cider is a local cider. Do they make different types? I mean, they have a couple. I don't have the bottle with me, so I couldn't tell you what specifically this one is, but I think it's one of their specialty, like year end blends that they did. Very good. I would recommend that you try them, except that I don't know if you can get them in DC. <laughs> Well, maybe when I'm in California. Yes. Even your hand-delivered cider. I just get my cider from the grocery store. <laughs> I just, Blindwood are so, they're so nice and their cider is good. I just want to, like, I want to support them. I want to shout about them. <laughs> no, I mean, that's awesome. I just, yeah. Is it just me or, or is Lily a little bit more basic than Sarah? <laughs> oh, that's 100% true. Yes. <laughs> There's no question at all. <laughs> but what are you drinking tonight, Dan? Well, it's a sad story. I'm drinking some bullshit bubbly water with some, you know, Mio squirt in it to get me a little bit of caffeine. I had planned on drinking. I had a couple of lovely sours that I was going to drink, but I got my shingles vaccine yesterday Mm -hmm. and I'm feeling like ever so slightly not like amazing. So I was like, I think I need, I mean, I'm fine. I I just like little light headache and whatever um, earlier today. So I'm like caffeine probably over alcohol is a better choice since I have to get up at 6am anyway. So, so I'm sorry to disappoint. (laughs) Thank you for joining us, even though you have to wake up in like basically half an hour. (laughs) That's not enough time at all. In reality, I usually get to bed like around midnight or a little bit thereafter anyway. So it's not going to be that different. I'll just be chatting with you instead of uh, sprinting and then chatting in the discord. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm glad it won't be entirely our fault when you're dead on your feet tomorrow. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Before we get into the book Wait, that what we are, will What be... are you drinking, yeah, seriously. really? Oh, you Again, with the forgetting <laughs> yourself. <laughs> uh, I kind of talked about it earlier from the grocery store, but it is a local brand. So we just have local brands in the grocery store. Maybe Washington's well, just cooler. I don't know. I've got, I've got local brands in the grocery store. <laughs> I buy local from BevMo. <laughs> I'm drinking Incline, and I found a cranberry cider, which is very nice. It's tart. It's not super sweet. Uh, and it's quite delicious. But it was not hand-delivered to your door by someone with a cute newborn. No. No. I mean, to be fair, I probably wouldn't think that Drew's child was cute because I'm not a child person. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I haven't seen the child, so I'm assuming that the child is cute. Uh, well, I would have just said newborn. Okay. <laughs> What's funny, when my kids were newborns, uh, of course, I thought they were cute. And then I looked at pictures of them a year later. I'm like, oh, my God, they were not cute at all. (laughs) (laughs) But I was blinded in the moment to think that they were. And they are now. So parental bias, all those hormones. Yeah. Yeah. They control us. So since this is a book podcast, (laughs) anyone read anything good lately? Oh, me, me, me. Ooh, what have you read lately? So I read Death's Abyss by S.D. Simper. That's the third book in her Sea and Stars trilogy, which was very good. It's kind of dark romantic fantasy, sort of on the borderline between romantic fantasy and fantasy romance. We actually talked to her on Real Shit and Book Shit, which will come out soon. So I enjoyed that. And I'm currently, can we talk about what we're currently reading, what we have read? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm reading, I'm reading Fortune's Fool by Angela Board. <laughs> Uh, which is absolutely fucking amazing. And I'm having some thoughts about what she and Crystal do in particular in terms of creating that sort of palpable romantic tension that sort of draws you forward nonstop and how like how exactly that works. Anyway, it's totally impressive. And I especially love all the silk stuff, you know, the silkworms and the merchants and the Anyway, it's a very luscious and rich world. And only my only complaint is that I'm 30%, 31% in, and there's not been any of the, and there's, there's only been smoochy scenes that were bad. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been badgering Angela. She's like, it's a slow burn. I'm like, come on. Oh yeah. I'm not a slow burn reader. I'm really excited for that book though. My God, we read fortune's fool which is her like no we, no we read no um, smuggler's, smuggler's fortune, fortune. Yeah. yes and i actually listened to that episode and i've been considering because i'm scared of chunks and this book is 734 pages and i was like oh my god i can't read that and i was like well i read bright wash and that was great so they're the same number of words yeah so i was listening to your podcast and uh, lily i think you said that it wasn't quite as good as like a standalone in your eyes and so i was like oh well maybe i'll just suck it up and read fortune's fool 
So that's where I'm at now. And I'm sure I'll go back and read that because this is so damn good that I'm going to read everything she writes. So, right. I'm, I'm kind of of two minds because I wouldn't pick up a 700 page book for no reason. Uh, but you know, fortune's fool is short enough that you can read it. Smuggler's fortune. Smuggler's fortune. Damn, I'm sorry. Those names are very similar. <laughs> Smuggler's fortune is short enough that you can read on a whim and it's so good that it convinces you to read the longer one. But I suspect that reading the longer one first is a better experience. So I, well, I'll let you know when I read this, the other one. I guess what I'm saying is there's no downside. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm very excited about it. And uh, I will be shouting about it for a while because it's going to take me a while to read this book, but I'm sure I'll shout the whole way through. As you should. Sarah, I know what your answer is. Hit me. So I have been reading a little book called The Isle of a Thousand Worlds by Dan Fitzgerald. <laughs> Wait, so who is that? <laughs> he's this author named Dan Fitzgerald. I don't know if you've heard of him. You probably mm. have because he's wonderful. And I, um, yeah, I finished reading The Living Waters, which is the book that we're talking about today and immediately had to start Isle of a Thousand Worlds. And I was able to do that because we had an advanced copy. So I didn't have to wait for the book to come out, which was really nice. You know, I actually think I have heard of Dan Fitzgerald. Uh, he's actually the author of the books that I've been reading. What, what a, a coincidence. coincidence. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe I just walked into this. <laughs> Man, I'm still plugging my way through the mayor cycle. It Probably the only books I will have read for two years, not for the podcast. <laughs> uh, but I am going to read them. They're very good as time happens. I fully understand. I'm, I'm always ama- amazed at how many books you people read. <laughs> You people, you <laughs> podcast people. I mean, it helps to have the impetus of a podcast. Yes. How many books did you read last year? Do you know? 40 something. For the podcast, I believe we read 46, specifically that we discussed on the podcast. I read a hundred exactly last year. Wow. I did not. <laughs> I read 46. <laughs> I might have read like 15, maybe. I try to read one a month and a little bit more, but. the This was the first year, probably since I've been in middle school or uh, high school, that I've read that much. It's impressive. Like I certainly, last year, I certainly did not read nearly as much. Did you, did you all enjoy the Fonda Lee getting piled on for the, th- did you see the thing on Twitter? I did. Yeah, I, I did oh see. Oh, my God. I'm out of the loop. She, well, she just basically said, you know, like, I, I see people with, you know, having read 400 books in a year. Like, how is it even possible? And everybody got, you know, called her an elitist and all kinds of craziness. I'm just like, come on, people. No. <laughs> and yeah, somebody pointed was... out, like, a lot of a lot of these people are reading romance books, which do tend to read a little bit faster. Like, you just chuck them down like M&Ms, right? Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. not in any way a, a diss. It's actually a, one of the things I love about them. That's true. If I could count all the words of fan fiction that I read, <laughs> you my should. number would be higher. <laughs> Do you, does does uh, AO3 have like a little counter of how many words you've read anything? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't think that they have any any kind of counter. Yeah. You probably don't want any records of what anyone's read anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that is the one account that is not my same username everywhere else. <laughs> it would be a disaster if people found out what I bookmark there. <laughs> Was that everyone? Ah, oh, yes. I'm reading The Mayor Cycle. Sarah's reading Isle of a Thousand. Nope, still forgot it. I really That's need nice. everything in front no, of me. No, I I finished Isle of a Thousand Worlds. I didn't want to add it to our um, outline because I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> That's exciting. I hope you liked Vera. I did. Okay, Vera, did. Vera is my favorite side character. That's the otter. <laughs> there, yes, there is an otter. No, I it was Sarah. You guys could talk about spoilers, but you had to let me know so I could leave the room. It was it was wonderful. I really really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. And like I said, I had to immediately had to start reading it after reading The Living Waters. Well, I hope that wasn't too spicy for you. I know you don't always like spicy books. There were a lot of sex scenes, but it was good. You you can always you know I always tell figure people to skip over them a bit if they don't like it, right? I yes, one can. That's not how I work. <laughs> <laughs> I got to read it all. <laughs> Apologies for that. Well, we can talk about it later. And I, one of your questions was about the spicy sequels. And I, and I feel bad about it because it's kind of like strategically a problem, but uh, there's nothing to be done once the book started being written. I was like, well, fuck, I guess that's just the way this is going to be. 
So it is on purpose. You do put all the fun. No, sex not at all. To <laughs> like literally, literally, I, I wrote the Living Waters, <laughs> and then I got the idea for the next book, and I created this character. And then all of a sudden she's like super fucking horny. And I'm like, God damn it. So the first book has like literally one kiss and the second book has everything. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. Before we get too far into discussing the living waters, do we want to give like a quick overview of what the book is about? It's about some very privileged people in a fantasy world going on a, not a holiday. They call it a rough about. They're experiencing camping, basically. Sort of like a rumspringa. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I was reading it in the beginning. And things go awry. They do. <laughs> One of the questions posed is, are the living waters real? I did highlight that section and say, I bet they are, <laughs> <laughs> since it's the title of the book. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, it was kind of uh, telegraphed a little bit, wasn't it? I mean, you can't really write a book about a mythical place and have people journeying, looking for the mythical place, only for that mythical place not to exist, right? Sue Baby on Twitter is organizing in March, March of the sequels. And I figured that since we have you on, even though this episode is not coming out anywhere near March, <laughs> we, we, would, we would ask some questions about writing sequels. Indeed. And I'll tell you that Sue interviewed me for March of the sequels, and I've already sent my answers off to her, although I'm sure your questions will be different. They better be. If not, just say skip. <laughs> I don't know about that, but they come out first. Exactly. <laughs> so the first question was, when you're planning out a series, do you kind of plan it out as a whole, or is it one book at a time? We got some really good air <laughs> quotes there, which I think might be the answer. <laughs> So I don't really plan series very much, uh, although I will say I'm planning my next one a little bit more. So typically I write a book and then some point during that book, I realize what the next book is going to be. And sometimes I might even have an idea about the third book, but I don't plan particularly. In fact, The Living Waters is a, a kind of extreme example that I, I've started off writing it thinking it was going to be a standalone unrelated to anything else. And then I got a little in, I was like, wait a minute. And that was sort of when I got this larger idea for the, the whole thing. So you have the Mare Cycle, which is a trilogy, and you have the Weird Water Conference, which is a duology. And I got this idea for a larger thing that would include something that we'll talk about a little bit later, a third series that would all be part of one sort of enclosed, completed thing. So in you know a year and a half or so, wait, let me do the math. In two years from now, the whole thing, which I think was going to be called the Copper Circle will be complete. It'll be three series, two trilogies and, and a duology. But it normally doesn't happen until I'm pretty well into the writing of the first book before I know what's going to happen. And I didn't think that The Living Waters would have a sequel until I got, you know, maybe halfway through. I mean, I didn't really know. I just kind of was writing. So I do not just the same way as I write a book. I just kind of, as we call it in the business, pantsing. I pants my way through it like writing by the seat of my pants. Uh, and occasionally I'll stop and like make a few notes. So I like, I have a doc for, or not a doc, actually a note to my phone for um, Weird Water Confluence when I was writing it. And it would just be like random shit that would come to me. Like I'm watching, you know, Buffy and like just out of the blue or I'm watching NCIS LA, which is a terrible show, but we can't stop watching it. <laughs> and I'll just whip up my phone because some random idea got in my head. And so I have this jumble of like 50 lines of just random crap. And I don't always actually go back and look at the random crap, but the act of putting the random crap in my phone tends to create the process whereby my brain fills in the blanks. So no, I don't plan sequels at all, which is why I have sequels that are totally different <laughs> than the first book. Which is so that means that, that theoretically there could be a fourth series that's part of your copper circle. That's true. There is actually one book that's been vaguely planned. That's called, it would be called the ward, which would be the story of Theo. So at the beginning of, Hollow Road, there's a character named Theo who's already dead. Like his death is what spurs the whole thing to happen. And I had an idea for a story about him. I actually wrote the opening to it. And it would also include Finn from the Mare Cycle. So Finn and Theo. So maybe that gets written someday, but I also, by the time I get finished, I might want to go somewhere else. Or I have this vague idea about the origin of the painted faces. Everyone complains that they wanted more painted faces. And, and I feel like a bad, like world building tease. Uh, <laughs> for not giving more. And I was like, maybe it would be interesting to write, you know, the, like how did this whole society come about? So who knows? 
but at this point there are no definitive plans for anything and i kind of might want to move on to something completely different when when the next trilogy is done but i don't know for sure next trilogy next duology next so the next trilogy after this duology there's a trilogy okay i didn't realize that it was going to be a trilogy that's exciting yes i don't know if this is as good a time as any to mention it but maybe it is this is a good a time as any to mention it Sure. This will this will be the first place that this will be announced, and I'll announce it formally after that. So I just signed a contract for a new trilogy. It's called The Time Before, and it is set like 2,000 years before the events of the Mare Cycle and the Weird Water Confluence, and it deals with the original civilization that is seen as a relic in the other books. And it will in- include a lot of uh, magical tech and it will almost feel modern in the sense that there's a, in the same way that there's a mystical social media in the Isle of a Thousand Worlds, this will be sort of the, everybody will be part of this connected universe, connected world, and they'll be longing for the time before that. So that's the main thing. The, the tagline is romantic fantasy with grit. And the first book, which is halfway written, or a little more than halfway written, maybe, which is called The Delve which is sexy, romantic, spicy dungeon fantasy. So that you heard it here first, the contract is signed and I'll be sharing more about it soon, but it's very exciting. And I have really, I have stronger ideas about this one. Like I know what the second and third books are going to be about, which I didn't know for any of the other things. And they'll all be different. The first one is like very violent, very fast paced, very sexy. The second one is going to be a little bit more of a sweet, maybe a little bit slow burny romance type of thing. And the third one is going to be kind of a wild, I don't even know how to describe it, so I'm not going to, but it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be epic and emotional and other type of sense. It's all about the end of the civilization that came before that eventually is shown in the later books. That kind of sounds like you've planned all three of them out. I have, and I, I've never done it before yourself. like this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, maybe I've, I don't, I've evolved or changed, or maybe it's just this one happened to be that way. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking farther ahead now, the more I write, the more I get used to, okay, this is how long it takes me to write a book. This is how long it takes to publish it, edit it, whatever. And so like, I, I'm able to think a year or two or three ahead, where I, which I couldn't before because I had no idea what the hell I was doing, which not to say that I do now, but I have a little <laughs> bit more of an idea than I used to. So that kind of leads us to another question, which was, well, the original question was at what point during the process of writing the mayor cycle did you come up with the idea for the weird water confluence, but maybe even more granular, like at what point of writing the living waters, did you start sort of percolating the idea for the sequel? It was pretty close to, I would say past the halfway point Mm -hmm. because, you know, at the very end of the book, we tease the, the mystical social media. And I talked a bit, you know, Gilea's character has this meditation magic background and thinking about where that came from and, and where she was trying to go. We, like, we know she's trying to get to this place called End Alive, but what the hell that is, we don't know. And so I started thinking about that and picturing what it was like there. And then I think maybe a, shortly after the character of Patia came in, that's the side character alchemist in The Living Waters, whose Quicksilver gets stolen. That character, that moment just sort of started spinning into my head. And I was like, I want to know more about her. But it didn't happen right away because she's at about 30 or 5 or 40%, I think. But because I couldn't get her out of my head, eventually that led me to realize that the story wasn't just about the mystical social media, but it was also about this alchemist. So it kind of evolved. It spun off from the main characters, one of the main characters motivations, Gilia, which I was trying to figure out as I wrote. And the second one was this side character and who the hell she was. And why did I want to write about her so much? I don't know, but I did. I love Gilia. I'm so excited to read another book with her. Sarah spoiled it a little bit. (laughs) I didn't. I know I didn't. I guess it's not technically a spoiler. She teased me a little bit that Gilia is a main focus of the second book. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not exactly hiding that. Uh, That's (laughs) been stated publicly. So that's, That's, uh, yeah, that's not a a spoiler. I, I'm a, I don't read summaries. Like literally any detail is a spoiler to me. I'm not mad about it. I'm just, that's how I think of it. Yes. Well, I can also (laughs) say that not in a non-spoilery way that, you know, both of these books are safe reading space in the sense that no characters will be dying over the course of either of the two books. And there will be happy ends for everyone. Although that what that form that takes is a bit different for each one. Mm, I really appreciate that. (laughs) We just read a very gritty, that's not quite the right word. No, how, 
how the hell do you explain no fat gloss in one word a very trying Ooh. book uh, <laughs> i'm very interested to hear about this i saw that you have a podcast on it so yeah so we yeah. won't redo the whole podcast at you but there's a lot of violence and angst and it i mean the whole book is fulfilling and ends up in a good place but it really punches you while you're getting there yeah it's it's a really really good book but it has some very dark points and a lot of as lily said a lot of violence and death so it's nice to read something that's not like that sometimes oh, yes. coming to the living waters after that was just like so i read it mostly like under an electric blanket with my cats and so just the whole experience felt like a hug even though like there there are high stakes in the living waters and there's mud worms Oh God! Those were those were. Yeah. Why are you doing this to us? <laughs> I feel so bad about that. I'm like, oh, come float in the living waters, and then like, there's these parasitic worms that burrow into your feet. I mean, that's just. I wish I wish it had happened differently. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of what made the book so compelling is that it wasn't just this sort of warm and fuzzy hug the entire time. There, it actually balances quite a few genres without fully tipping over into any of them. I say because I'm calling that mudworm scene body horror yes. <laughs> because it was. I, well, I should say that one of the, one of the Shadow Spark owners won't read the book because she has um, what's it thing called where you have fear of tiny holes, oh, things like lotus pods. Trico, and, yes, trico that one or, or tripo. Yeah, she's tripo, like, it sounds like yeah. a great book, but I'll never read it. Sorry. <laughs> like, fair enough. I don't blame her. Yeah, I, yeah. That, there were a lot of all caps texts between Sarah and I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, no, I'm sorry. It's the one thing that everybody mentions too. Like you know, every single review is like, oh, blah 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 blah. The, the fucking mud worms. <laughs> but it was so perfect for that moment in the book because our two, well, the two privileged characters who are going on this rough about. I would say there's four main characters. Um, this is sort of the first time that they really experience consequences of leaving their ivory tower, so to speak. And it was hard on me, but it was harder on them. <laughs> yes. So it, it, it fit very well into the story, but it was definitely like, a, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I have to ask, because you've said that this book was inspired by a raft trip that you took. Does that include the mudworms? No, the mudworms was completely. <laughs> so I was I was literally thinking like, well, you know, these these are very fragile people in the text. It's clear that they have they you know, they're they have very fragile skin. And so I'm like, well, they clearly they would be susceptible to skin parasites and mosquitoes and other stuff. But I, I was like, what, you know, I was just sort of research, like, you know, skin parasites. And I was like trying to get some ideas for something. And I was like, what kind of diseases would they come across? So I just got this idea and I just went with it. And I wish, so I sort of wish it had been a little bit different because I know it's a bit heavy for the rest of the books, but it's only like a couple chapters. So, you know, could, people can survive. It didn't feel overwhelming. I mean, it was horrible, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't something that you're like, oh, I, I can't read this book yes no so the raft trip had no body horror uh, the actual raft trip that i took one and i've said <laughs> it was when good. i was 13 but i double checked it was actually when i was 12 so imagine this you're a, a mother of five and you have a friend kind of like in your hippie crowd my mom was like a what we call like a, a non-pot smoking more environmentalist type <laughs> hippie back in the day so she you know she worked in an environmental nonprofit, and she was you know went to the co-op and got us like carob easter bunnies for which <laughs> I think I've never recovered. I mean, a carob Easter bunny, who does that to a child? <laughs> anyway, her friend of hers was like, hey, I'm building a 40-foot log raft and sailing it from Cincinnati down to Baton Rouge. And I'm building it as a as a outdoor school on a log raft. Like you want to send your kid on for a couple of weeks and live off the river, muddy riverbanks of the Mississippi River and eat the fish that they catch and you know, whatever. And she's wow. like, let's do it. <laughs> and of course, I was like, I was like, let's fucking go. Cause like fishing was my life at that time. Like we would go down to the local stink ditch and my friend Jamie and I, and just go fishing. Like any chance we got, we would spend hours and hours down there. And I was just always obsessed with like, what's in this muddy water because the Creek. So I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And there was this Creek called Beargrass Creek. And it's just stinky, mucky, you know, it's got little sewage inputs and whatever, but you know, like any Creek anywhere, it's full of fish. And the contrast between the, the, dirtiness and the being on the next to 
you know, next to a city and having all this like sewage and pollution, but also there's all this life burgeoning out of it definitely was inspiring. And we had a very similar experience on the Mississippi. I don't know if I should continue talking about the raft trip because I've sort of uh, leapfrogged ahead a little bit. Oh, please do though. I have to admit, obviously the living waters love me some fantasy, enjoyed it quite a bit, but I could just read an entire book series about Leo going up and down his little muddy river and like (laughs) fishing and swimming in it. And uh, that that was so great. (laughs) Thank you. Well, so the, this, Real person named Phil Babiak definitely inspired that character as much as uh, anything. And he was wild. So he he once kayaked the Northwest Passage when he was in like just out of high school. So we're talking about like several thousand miles on a kayak. Wow. With with a, with a buddy. And, you know, he was a, like the consummate outdoorsman. So he would like shoot carp with his bow and arrow and like cook them over. Have you ever eaten carp? No, I do not think like, so. They're very, very bony. Like, I've had pet carp. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they don't taste good. And for the size that they are, there's so much bone that you're like picking like little bits of meat out of the bone unless you're really good at it. You know, he would shoot like a snake and like cook it up and eat it. Like any, basically, he he knew what plants you could eat, like nettles. And so he wrote actually wrote a book. I think it's called Kayak in the Northwest Passage, where he talked about this. So I read that book. And part of my preparation for writing this and doing research was finding out like how do you subsistence fish and hunt and, you know, what can you eat? And they did also have some money and they bought, you know, food because you need a high calorie food to kayak, mm-hmm. you know, especially upstream as they were doing. But anyway, a lot, a lot of research in that. And he did the raft trip once just on a lark and he liked it so much that he did it again, but he was like, I got to pay for it. So let's build it as an outdoor school on a log raft, which he did. And it was absolutely brilliant. Like I learned more in two weeks there than I did, you know, in any year of my life, I would say otherwise. And we had to catch almost all of our food. I know they had like flour and stuff. So we would have, you know, enough calories, but we caught fish and turtles and he went out and shot a beaver with his 22 one day and brought it back. And we had roasted beaver tail (laughs) Uh, and everything was cooked on the, the raft was 40 foot long. It's basically just long logs for like, he chopped down a bunch of trees and lashed them together and made this raft. And then on top, it was a 12 by 12 by 12 cabin made of plywood. And then built into the roof was basically a sheet of metal that had been sort of dented in the middle for like a fire pit. And I remember specifically remember seeing the insulation between the metal and the plywood. So you're cooking a fire on top of the wooden box, basically. <laughs> oh, wow. It, it has children sleeping in it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's on a river. I can't catch fire. Yeah, There's it's water fine, there. It's fine. <laughs> but I remember the beaver tail specifically. I remember him scoring it with his knife and like, roasting it over this fire and like at all because basically the tail is mostly fat so like it was just this sizzling hot like fat basically that we ate and it was kind of good beaver <laughs> the actual meat itself was like really funky mm-hmm. not a delicacy to, to my taste actually most of the fish most of the fish we ate was not great catfish was the least bad but all fish from the mississippi has kind of had that muddy thing going on so but it was, it was, I didn't care. I was like, I'm, I had to fish every day. My job was to catch dinner. I was like, that was <laughs> exactly what I wanted. So he sent us off one day, Jamie and I, we who were both 12, sent us off because we had to wait for two people to show up that were joining us like two days later. And Phil was like, okay, I'm going to walk you to the slough, which for those who don't know, that's S-L-O-U-G-H. It's like a little slack water area off of a main river. That's how you pronounce that? I was thinking of you specifically. <laughs> If you hadn't spelled it, I would have thought that was a completely different word. Right. Because you're thinking like when you slough something off, it's spelled yes. the same way. Yeah. yeah. But so the, anyway, so Thank we you. went to this slough and, you know, he, he had a couple of fishing poles and he was like, you know, here's some fishing equipment. And he's like, you, here's a couple of bottles of water and like some PB and J sandwiches, you know, <laughs> come back at six. It was like two miles away from the raft. So we literally spent the entire day, like we dig up some worms, go fishing in the slough, keep the fish on a little stringer, and then like schlep them back to the raft where we would scale them and cook them and eat them. And it was absolute paradise for us. I mean, it was like the best thing that ever happened was just hanging out and fishing. Like, that's my job. I got to bring back dinner. Okay, I'm, I'm here. So like stuff like that. And a lot of the little things that I remember from the trip definitely, you know, made it in in some form or another into the story. But I obviously changed a lot of things and a lot of it was just inspiration, but like hundred percent, that trip was just the most amazing thing ever happened. 
And I could talk about it for a long time, but I'm going to give you just two more details, unless you have specific questions. One, we took a little side trip into another slough, which was very swampy and dark, even though it was daytime, it was like really dark in there. It was almost mangrovey, even though it wasn't mangroves, like it kind of had that feel to it. And they have, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a gar, but gar are these really long skinny fish with te- needle teeth. Only on TV. <laughs> okay. So we're in the canoe heading into this thing. And like everywhere you go, you have to like back up and like remove your canoe because you get stuck on like little log jams and sticks and whatever. So at one point we had, you know, stopped and got stuck on this branch. And I look down under and I see this, this shape that's, you know, like the size of my leg seems like. And it, it starts going under the boat and I, and I look on the other side and it comes out and it just keeps on coming out. It must've been like six feet long. And I was like, holy shit, if I fall out of this canoe, I'm going to be in the water with a six foot long, toothy, creepy, whatever. And of course, Gar are not really aggressive toward people at all, but they're still, you know, scary. And then at another time, a few days earlier or later, the Gar were spawning, which means that they were swimming upstream in pairs and sort of flapping about. And we were swimming, Phil had made a rope ladder for us to swing and jump into the water, just like to have a bit of fun. So we would jump in, they would like float downstream and swim back up to get on it again. And as we were swimming back up along the stream, the, the gar, because they have all these little snaggly teeth, they would get stuck in your swimsuit every now and then. So you can imagine <laughs> this flopping. Now these were smaller ones. They were like, maybe like one or two feet long, but a two foot long toothy fish getting stuck in your swimsuit and like flapping around. Definitely was an experience, but I, you know, it didn't bother me. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And they even took one of the gar. Cause so there was a dog and a pig on the boat that were like pets and it, to show us about how gar have a primitive lung so they can breathe air in addition to water. He put one of the gars that he had caught, I think in a net must've been like two or three feet long. He put it in the crack in between two logs on the boat. So it would occasionally get splashed by water, but it was otherwise out of the water and it lived for like two days and eventually he let it go. This was just like to teach us about how adaptable these creatures were. So yes, a lot of inspiration came from this trip. And I considered before I started writing living waters, I considered writing like a memoir about the trip because I could certainly have filled many pages with that. But then I was like, I don't really know enough about the specific people involved because there were a lot of relationship dynamics among the adults that I was only vaguely aware of that I'm sure would be very interesting. (laughs) But uh, I decided I was like, you know, I, I want to. I've been writing fantasy, so let me just keep on with that. And that was how the book originally came about. And a lot of things changed since then. But you can feel, you know, I could point to like eight or nine places in the book where, like, oh yeah, that happened to me, or I saw something almost exactly like this. That's incredible. Now thinking back on the book with that as context, it fits so perfectly because there are so many aspects of this adventure that feel wild but not unrealistic and it makes perfect sense that yeah it's because it happened I think for me like I've never been on a raft trip but I've gone backpacking with my father a couple of times and this really reminded me of that kind of vibe obviously very different settings but reading it I was like oh I really want to go on another backpacking trip like I want to be out in nature Yes, I desperately want to be out in nature all the time and it's hard because I can take my kids out somewhat but like not on a you know, multiple day, like get away from it all type of thing, which I feel like we all desperately need. Rivers are so alien to me. I grew up in Southern California. So whenever we went camping, it was always like Joshua tree, (laughs) which is a completely different location. Do you remember the the three rivers trips that we used to go on? No, because (laughs) all like all of us California relatives went to three rivers a couple of times. And I know that one time, the only time that really stands out to me, and I think that you were there, but you would probably have been like five. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like one, one time. That's a trick it was, question. <laughs> it was really, it was really raining. Like it was pouring and I think it started flooding. And I think we had to leave the trip early because our, like our rental house was right by the river. I don't remember that. I do remember camping in arches and there was a windstorm and our tent blew over. So we ended up sleeping in the back of our truck instead. <laughs> Luckily, that was car camping and not real <laughs> camping. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. I don't know what we would have done. <laughs> well, I grew up in Boy Scouts, so I did a lot of real camping. But I, mm-hmm. in my adult life, I'm, I'm as big a fan of car camping as I can be. Yeah. This is a trick, not a trick question, a surprise question, because I didn't write it down. But okay. Are the breath fins those cute, like pink Amazon dolphins? 
they're uh, probably a little bit related. Yes. Yeah. I, I I don't know exactly how I came up with this idea, but you know, clearly there are pink freshwater dolphins that live in the Amazon, so they're a bit inspired by that. Yes. Okay. I and I, I think Sarah may have mentioned somewhere. I think in the in the document, you know, one of the things I tried to do is rename common creatures so that it, that you could imagine them being a little bit different, but that you could figure out like a breath fin, like obviously that's going to be a, a dolphin or a, so most of the animals, not all um, have names that kind of tell you what they are and a few that don't. Because one of the things that drives me nuts in fantasy is overload of names and 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 words that are just plain old fucking made up. And yeah. while that can be a lot of fun, and I know it's fun to write, and some people really dig reading it, it's why I can't read epic fantasy. Like I, I read Witchwood Crown, I think it was Tad Williams, and I was so fucking lost. I'm like 300 pages in, I have no fucking idea what's what's happening, and you know, there's you know, you're jumping back and forth from one place to the next, where there's totally different characters with really weird fucking names, and I was like, I definitely want to make sure that all of my fantasy does not do that. So like in my, the mare cycle, you know, the main characters are Carl, Finn and Cindy, like easy to remember. And, you know, the mare, their names are a little bit harder to remember, but they're all based on like European names. So it just twisted a little bit to make them sound, you know, unusual. But yes, I'm a very big fan of comprehensible fantasy input. I think I mentioned this in one of our previous episodes, but there was like a couple month gap in between when I started the mayor cycle and then when I picked it back up. And I usually have to restart books when I have that long of a lag time, but I actually remembered where I was. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> I think that actually that discussion comes up in our No Fuck Loss episode. So it will be out. Which came out today. Okay. No, it's out. It's out. Yeah, it's out. I saw it. I haven't, I haven't listened to it yet. How does time work? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it does make, it makes the book so much more accessible. I definitely appreciated that. I think I have a much a much higher tolerance for fantasy jargon. Yes. And I hope that I didn't come off as as dissing on people who, who <laughs> write and read. No, not at all. You know, highly complicated. Not at all. No, we're the beautiful. simpletons who just can't handle it. <laughs> or me. I shouldn't loop Sarah in with me. But Sarah actually made a pretty clear effort to distinguish herself from you in yeah. that previous statement. <laughs> No, I mean, I think I think there's something to be said for being able to immediately recognize the creatures and the people who are in a in a novel, especially when it's on the shorter side. Not that I would call your books short, but they're certainly not. I mean, 300 pages, that's pretty short for a fantasy. Book. <laughs> yeah, like that's that's certainly not, you know, the 600 page chonkers that that seem to be popular these days. Yeah, I, I have a very like I can't easily read books that long and I can't even imagine writing a, a book that long I mean to me like it's almost bizarre whenever I start writing a book it naturally seems to come to a conclusion somewhere between like 85 and 90 thousand words it's it's a pattern that seems to have formed itself in my head I think the Isle of a Thousand Worlds is a tiny bit longer I think it's like 94 95 but all you know anything under 100 is pretty short for fantasy and um, I don't know what it is about my brain that just wants wants a story to have that sort of size and shape. But even the the book I'm writing now, like it's it might even run a little bit shorter. I don't know. But I just I, I want to be done with the story and moving on to the next one. I don't know why my brain just likes it that way. And I don't plan it out like it just happens. It's kind of bizarre. So you've talked a little bit about how you develop your storyline as you go along during your writing process. But I was wondering how the symbiotic relationship between the Ipsis, which are sort of these humanoid, mostly humanoid river dwelling creatures, and the Citri, who are these sort of water creatures. I don't know where that sentence went. Those are the two creatures, <laughs> how, but they have a very interesting symbiotic relationship. And I was wondering how that came about. I can't say for sure, but I know that I knew that the living waters was going to be clear water as opposed to the main river, which was muddy. And then I was like, well, how do you get clear water out of a muddy water river? Other than maybe there's clear water coming from somewhere else. And so I was thinking, and I, by the way, I often refer to the Ipsis as, um, as like river ogres or long necked river ogres or something, even though they're not really ogreish in some ways, like, you know, large humanoids that aren't quite giants to me, that's like an ogre. They're ogres with like a very high intelligence stat. <laughs> yes. Well, I see this is the thing. I always have felt that ogres get the short end of the stick. And I actually wrote a, a book that I trunked, but may come, come out again 
a book about a an ogre sized being that's kind of like an alien that that suddenly appears in the middle of Washington D.C. Like not in the not in the capital like in where the buildings are, but like in one of the park areas that nobody goes to and is discovered by like homeless people who then form a relationship with it and try to figure out, you know, how it got there and help it get back. But it all started a conversation with a friend of mine about how there was, you know, there were vampire stories, there were elf stories, like there's even orc stories, but like who's ever written about an ogre? Like, and why do ogres have to just be big and dumb? Like, why can't they just be big and smart and like, you know, caring and and whatever. So that book, which is which is sitting in a trunk somewhere for for various reasons, and maybe someday will be reworked, is one example of it. And of course, the Ipsis are another example of my wanting larger than normal human sized creatures to be just as smart and not so doofusy. <laughs> so anyway, back to your original question. <laughs> Other than ogres get the shaft, so let's put some smart ones in there. So how do you get clear water out of a river? So like I'm thinking, well, a lot of aquatic plants filter. Uh, water out. And the river that's nearest to me, the Anacostia River, is a very muddy river, but that was not always so. It only became muddy through agricultural practices in the like 18th century, 19th century. And it used to be more clear. And I know that they try to build up the marsh grasses in order to filter some of the water. So I was like, how could we filter the water? And I had this idea that there would be this blade grass that kind of its roots filter the water but then I was like well how does it like get there and and then I had this idea of these creatures that kind of were, like farmed it and that's that's where it came from but I also had the idea that this the citri which are these swirls that also can take other forms these mysterious watery beings that we could talk more about in the spoiler section that they need clear water to thrive and that's part of the reason why you don't often see them on the main river. And so these two things kind of came together, the idea that we have to have a clear water area. How does it get maintained? And me always wanting to put in oversized, intelligent, and uh, emotionally available creatures in my books. <laughs> I have noticed that, well, I'm going to call it a trend. I read entirely two whole books of yours, <laughs> I'd say, which makes I'd me say an expert. Two and a half at least. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still declaring myself an expert. Okay, go ahead. In Dan no, Fitzgerald I'm not, literature. I'm not, I will confirm or deny your... I'm not <laughs> denying... I'm not denying your, your expertise. I am. That's why I'm saying it like a joke. <laughs> I'm just saying that you have read more than two books. You might have read less than three, but it's more than two. All right. In the worlds that you built, in any case, I have noticed the trend of creating these strange others and then making them familiar. With with the mayor and then also the Ipsis. And I thought that was I, I really enjoyed that process. Discovering these other beings through the eyes of the characters in the book was always really fun. Well, this one of the reasons that I wrote Hollow Road is I hate this the evil race trope in fantasy. Mm -hmm. So whenever I read a fantasy book, if there's like an entire race of people that's evil, I'm like, this book is literally racist. Like it may not be racist but against an actual like race or ethnicity, but like mm -hmm. the idea that an entire series of beings that are intelligent could be evil. That's just like, yuck. Yeah. But obviously we have these legends. So, uh, and there's been a lot of books that don't do that. And a lot of books that have the kind hearted or grandma or whatever, but I wanted to have that, you know, the other that seems monstrous at first and then is discovered to be maybe less so. And that cycle continues. The reason the mayor cycle is called a cycle is because the humans see the mayor as monstrous. But then it turns out in the second book that the mayor have other mayor that they see as monstrous. And that cycle continues in the third book and it comes around a little bit. So yeah, I just, I, I hate, I hate, hate, hate that trope so much. And I also like in D&D, &D, like the idea of you know, D&D is fun. Like you want to, you know, create characters and go off and like slay monsters. But why are you really slaying these monsters? Like if they're intelligent, why do they have to always be evil? And uh, I was like, what if you had a D&D &D campaign where instead of slaying the monsters or you slay the monsters and you realize that you shouldn't have done that. And there's always these cases. I don't know uh, how much you all play or have played D&D. &D. I know the answer is not zero. The answer is not zero. Okay. Yes. But we often have this case where you like you slay the orcs and then there's like the orc children and women and children, like, first of all, like, hello, um, <laughs> sexism. <laughs> but w then you have to deal with them. And sometimes as a player, it's annoying. Like, well, I don't want to deal with these like women and children, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, that's kind of more interesting part is, you know, after the killing is done, what happens to everybody who's left? And the idea that you can really see that the mayor are not entirely evil because they have, you know, children and non-combatants that 
clearly have language and everything else. So anyway, de-othering is a thing that I, I would say I always like to do. And in the upcoming trilogy, the time before, the humans are the other all the main characters are mayor and the humans are the other. We call them the fucking humans with a little TM. <laughs> That's what I call us too. <laughs> right? A lot of people are definitely, oh yeah, I can see that. I get the impression that they deserve that name. Is they it a do. stretch? <laughs> they do, but it's, you know, it's complicated. It's always complicated. That's the other thing I wanted to do. I didn't want it to be, oh, these monsters are just noble. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so the the mayor, the ones that, you know, that the humans in the in Hollow Road fight against, like there's some pretty ignoble shit that they did. So it's not, it's, I wanted it to be a messy in that way. And I, I hope it was messy enough. Some people said it wasn't messy enough, but oh, well, what are you going to do? I personally thought it was it, messy enough to make me ask questions, but not so messy that, I was stressed out reading the book, which is exactly the place I want to be. <laughs> I wanted to touch upon a little bit the variety of relationships in general that you have in your books and how it's not just, you know, a man and a woman live happily ever after and get married. You have a whole bunch of different kinds of relationships. And like, do you know how these I don't want to say relationships again because I've said it an awful lot. <laughs> but this is a very unbranded statement because in almost every episode you have like last episode it was the thing about things with mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't avoid you get to a point in the in the evening where you just start repeating your words yes over and over but then it becomes funny so you do it more on purpose. <laughs> So I think I can answer your question, which has been sufficiently asked. Well, actually, you didn't quite finish it. (laughs) I'm looking at my notes so I can fill it out. (laughs) Sarah, the question that we actually wrote ahead of time was, do you know how these relationships will evolve when you begin writing the characters? I think you kind of already answered this with plotting out the books, but... I was getting there. I just had said relationship an awful lot and didn't want to use, reuse the word. <laughs> That's all. So I definitely don't. And a, and a perfect example of that is in the Isle of a Thousand Worlds where Patia goes off to, I thought she was going to go off to Rontea and have a relationship with Paro, the mysterious guy that supposedly discovered the universal tincture. But then like, you know, a couple chapters in, she runs across Jiro and I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's where this is going. Do I need to leave the room? No, no, no. You're fine. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it comes across within the first few chapters. All right. She meets this, she meets this, this little cinnamon roll of a, of a guy and um, good things ensue. <laughs> that's my favorite description. <laughs> you and Crystal both describe your characters as cinnamon rolls. I think that's always a good sign. An author should always view their characters of cinnamon rolls <laughs> only the ones that are <laughs> but anyway i so with the with gilia the the relationship there i had literally no idea but the funny thing is that when i look back and reread it they're like the moments when they meet and the certain interactions like i discovered it fairly early on i i didn't know it first at all but in retrospect i went back there were two or three interactions that when i realized that where this was going I was editing and I was like, oh, I, I already laid this, the groundwork for this. So yeah, I, guess... I, I definitely thought that was being telegraphed from the beginning. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it was. And then I may have gone back and tweaked it a little bit, but like it was already there and it was not originally intended to be that way. So that was an accident. And then going to the other one, oh, I had the only thing I knew about for Hollow Road is that there were three characters, two male and one female, and there was not going to be any relationships between the three of them. There would be no love triangles or no anything. There might be some slight feelings, but they would be, you know, they would just deal with them and move on and that would be fine. So that was I, how I did that. Can I just like take that sound bite? There would be feelings, but they would deal with them and move on. That's so wonderful. Like, I feel like in fiction, relationships are either they get together and end up happily ever after, or everything's a chaotic disaster and everything is bad. And your writing, your books have relationships that don't end in either of those ways, right? They, there's people who figure out how to be together in whatever relation is right for them. Maybe it's 
very little at all, or maybe it's, you know, more, more intimate or not. And it's good because they figure it out. And that's so nice. That's so wonderful. Well, thank you. I definitely don't like too much emotional drama. So you won't see me writing a, you know, Crystal (laughs) Matar-esque, you know, push and pull fighting. Actually, I have a little bit of that coming up, but no, for some reason, I don't gravitate toward uh, emotional romantic conflict as much, at least not open romantic conflict. I, I And I also feel like there are not plenty of stories out there where the emotional conflicts are very dramatic and, and splashy. And I like sometimes for it to be, I like things to be a little bit quieter. I think in general, <laughs> sometimes my writing might be too quiet for some readers, but I do think it's nice on occasion if things are not so exaggerated. And I don't mean to imply that that was in relation to Crystal, because that's my favorite, <laughs> my favorite fantasy book ever. But I, 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 w- I want things to be a little bit quieter. Even before I was writing fantasy, I used to write crime, and I was always looking for to write crime that was that was quieter and more character focused and less, like you don't have to have a big stupid at the end of every every movie or book or episode. Like there can just be a, a strange resolution that's not always you know a climactic battle where somebody scrambles for a weapon at the last second and. You know what I mean? Yeah. I also think just from a perspective of, I'm going to use the word representation, although I think it maybe has connotations that aren't what I'm referring to, but like not every instance of feelings has to end up with people getting together. And I think it's really good for people to see examples of that working out in a really healthy way. And it's just really nice to read about. Like I said, it, Reading it under an electric blanket covered in cats is the right way (laughs) to read these books. I also think that, yes, your stories have a lot of spice to them, but it's not that the relationships are exclusively sex-based. Right. Like, you have some relationships that are not focused on that at all, and the characters still have these very fulfilling connections. And so, like, I like that there's that breadth to it. Yeah, and I think I learned a lot. Phil, first of all, I come from a, a family where the the family joke is among my nieces and nephews and, and nibblings. Everybody is is like that one queer cousin that somebody has, you know. So like, I come from a background where I've been surrounded by people of all all identities through my personal life. But I also came. I also went to Catholic schools, and there was a lot of crazy homophobia there that I was participated in because I was an idiot and I didn't know what the fuck? And so eventually over time, when I started writing, I would read these books and I would be like, wow, I just read a like 800 page fantasy book. And every single fucking character in the entire book was cis hetero. And all the relationships that there were, were, you know, very much like up and down the line, like this is the way that things are supposed to be. And uh, getting on Twitter, I met so many people uh, and I learned so much from just, you know, reading like I would see a thread where somebody would, you know, talk about asexuality. And so, and and I would start reading the threads, like, you know, this really relates to a lot of things that I know about people that I, you know, things that I've seen in the world and that I've always didn't really know like what it was about. Um, and not to say that I know what it's about, but I followed a lot of people, a lot of different people and, you know, read and learned. And some people are like, Hey, ask me anything. So like, okay, so I'll ask him anything. So I had a lot of help and I know people often talk about, you know, never seeing anyone of their representation in in a book. And I think about like my students, I don't want my students to read. And if my students know that this podcast exists, I'm in deep fucking trouble. But like, (laughs) I want them to grow up in a world where, where, you know, books can have characters of a variety of identities and it's just not even really a thing. Like you would expect it. Like if I read a book that, or watch a TV show that doesn't have any variety at all, I I just think why even fucking bother? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think part of it is it's really important to me given, and I also, I think about my students, I have so many students, you know, who are very, some are open and some are not about their identities, but seeing some of them, like how they've struggled and how they've also flourished when they're in the right environment makes me feel like in a book, the same thing is true. And I know it's hard because people are scared. I was so fucking scared to write the characters that I wrote. Uh, I mean, I every single time I write a fucking book, I'm terrified that I've done something wrong. And I'm sure that I have. I mean, every book is going to have some issues. But I think that's also part of what 
at least hopefully makes it work because I'm so worried about it and I'm thinking about it and I'm asking questions about it. So hopefully that gets it to a point where even if there's some things that could be better, it's not, you know, problematic and hopefully it's mostly positive. And I've worked with this uh, authenticity reader a couple of times, three times actually, which has been really helpful. Yeah, I was I was going to say you have an authenticity or a sensitivity reader. So like you're going out of your way to make sure that as much as you can. Right, but I still ultimately have to, you know, you know I have to write the book and yeah. they can give me some suggestions, but like they're just one person and one person's opinion. So like, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody was like, well, this is actually a little bit problematic. And I would just be like, okay, I, you know, tell me more and I'll just sit here and listen to it because you know, that's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. It hasn't happened yet, but at least no one said it. And let's not say that it hasn't happened. I'm sure it has. But when I wrote my first, like in Hollow Road, you know, you you learn that Finn is gay, but I don't think it was introduced in a particularly good way. But I got a little bit more comfortable by the time I got to the archive. But I also like was sweating bullets, you know, writing a book where I'd, I'd never written, I'd hardly written any sex scenes at all. And here I'm writing, a, you know, MM sex scene. And I'd never done it before. So I had a friend who I was like texting all the time, like, cause he was really happy to help me with details. So, <laughs> so I'd be like, so how exactly does this work? And it got to the point where, you know, he was very like, he's good at giving me sort of clinical analytical information and very patient and understanding. And so that's helpful. Just developing relationships with people who are happy to help you. And people are so happy to help if you just reach out and ask so I've had a lot of DM conversations with people about certain things. So yeah, it's it's all about the community reaching out to the community. And you clearly are bringing such a such a positive energy to the experience too, right? It's not tell me I'm right. <laughs> I try. I'm sure I sometimes fail. Yeah. Sometimes my exuberance gets me in trouble. And I also feel like sometimes you know, I I'm always trying to push certain envelopes and maybe there are occasions where I push an envelope into somebody else's envelope territory and, and I shouldn't. So I try to, you know, limit that as much as I can, but like everybody, we're all going to screw up sometimes. I think the important part is that you're compassionate about it, you know, and you're quite obviously thinking about what you're doing and well-intentioned. So for sure, that's the point I was trying to make, but with more funny voices and less thoughtfulness. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely takes all kinds to make a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any other non-spoilery points we want to cover before we uh dive into the meat of this book well we don't have any spoilery questions written out it's quite so. all right no but i have spoilery opinions all right okay okay <laughs> so we're just going to get a lot of this is more of an opinion than a question <laughs> <laughs> but before we do that lily why should you read this book Oh, you should read this book if you want a really incredible fantasy anchored in re- anchored in realism. There we go. Not reality, realism. I like the use of the word anchored. I don't think that was intentional, but it is an A plus water pun. It wasn't. But also, you're right. If you, like me, watch a lot of ocean documentaries <laughs> <laughs> and think fish are cool, you will love this book. And if you really enjoy thoughtful relationships of platonic and romantic natures built between characters over time, you will absolutely love this book. If you want a book where no one dies at the end, then you would probably like this book. If you want a high octane adventure with a happy ending, you should read this book. <laughs> Is that, I think we've covered as much as we can without spoiling it. <laughs> well, you forgot to mention if you want a fantasy book that has no swords. <laughs> That's right. True. There are, true. No there are no swords. Yes, it's, it's, I call it sword-free fantasy for a reason. Man, you just blew my mind. Yes, but neither of the books has a sword in it. Yeah, that's that's a that's a big marketing point that you make yes, on Twitter. I don't know how successful it's sword been, but fantasy. I've really been trying to lead into it. <laughs> I've been trying to get you know, Quimby Olson is also writes sword-free fantasy. So my my dream someday is to get a sword-free fantasy panel that includes me and Quinn and some other people, and you know, get get it going. To avoid spoilers for The Living Waters, skip to 123.33. I wish that I had more time to read French. I miss French. Yeah, podcast, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> it's all your fault, Lily. You can start doing your half of the podcast in French if you like. Well, no, because my reading French is rusty, but my spoken <laughs> French is rustier. <laughs>
Dan could answer in French and I could, you know, respond in English. That's fine. I could do that. I think for the sake of our listeners, we could just go ahead and do it in English. That's fine. (laughs) Or we could do it in Eilish. Ooh, that was the big, like, they mentioned Eilish. Are these in the same world? (laughs) I I then talked to Sarah who had finished the book and she was like, duh. (laughs) Apparently that was no. I don't do Twitter. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, it's okay. It's, It's seeded a little bit through the book, but not very much. I wanted it to be totally independent but if you read the other books you'd be like aha 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 Mm -hmm. yeah like I mean I didn't because I've only read Hollow Road I haven't read the other two books in the series yet I do intend to but finding the free time is the is the difficult bit so I didn't actually catch that they were supposed to be in the same universe uh until you specifically mentioned the mayor at the end of the book like I was like oh Eilish that sounds kind of familiar but maybe I've just seen it in one of the snippets that Dan's posted on Twitter. Right. Well, that's okay. You know? That's kind of works work to my plan. And then the circlets show up and I was like, oh, because <laughs> at that point, our conversation was also, we know they happen in the same world, but we're not sure about the timeline. Right. And I was like, well, I know what's happening with the copper circlets where I am in the archive. Yes. <laughs> I did not. Yeah, that. That was something that escaped me. Although I think there's the the mayor character that they meet in Isle of a Thousand Worlds yes, Ujin. is in yeah she's she's in Hollow yes, Road yes yeah so I recognized her yes and she has a major role in the other two books yeah as well. I also have stated publicly that that Ujen makes a, a strange appearance in the Isle of a Thousand Worlds so that's not really a spoiler so yes technically speaking canonically speaking. The events of the Weird Water Confluence take place shortly after the events of the Mare Cycle. That was the feeling I got. Cool. In the Mare Cycle, though, the South is often referred to as this lawless, barbaric place. And of course, I knew all along that that was complete (laughs) bullshit, that it was exactly the opposite of that. But I didn't realize that I was writing in the South until I got a few chapters in and I was like, I was like, you know, this book could be (laughs) set in the aha. And so I just did it and I just seeded a few things in. Because I really wanted it to feel like a different world, but I also wanted it to be to be connected once I got to a certain point and I realized I was not writing a totally unrelated standalone. So yeah, there was some intentionality, although some of it was just serendipity. Okay. You set up this incredible, like wonderful, big warm hug through this entire book. It like still an adventure. There's still mud worms and shit. And then suddenly we get to the end and it turns out there's this huge like turf war going on that no one even knew about. How could you do this to me? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> How could you do this, do this to Lily specifically? Yeah. You mean between the Ipsis and the Citri? Uh, no, the uh, the Citri trying to or planning to take over and do lie. Yes, uh, so what's the question again? <laughs> How could you do this to me? It's not a good question. (laughs) This is more of a comment than a question. (laughs) Yes. Well, I mean, you may have noticed that I don't tend to have standard antagonists in the books. uh, And this is certainly no exception to that. And the idea of the, of the Citri of some of them, you know, wanting to spread out beyond the living waters came, especially as I was thinking about how polluted the river was and how pristine that they needed. They were like, well, back in the day, this whole place was pristine like this until the fucking humans came around. So we can just take it back. But I, I sort of, one of the hard things about writing about the sea tree, and these are the mysterious watery beings in a book for those who are hard of memory or who are listening to the spoiler session without reading, which is fine. I do that all the time. I listen to every single episode. I don't care about spoilers. <laughs> yes. So trying to trying to write very alien type of characters but have them have an actual personality that explains some of their behavior. I had some backstory that you never really see, like individual sea tree, you know, the the, the one, the leader of them who you sort of see, and you'll probably never notice what that, what they were, but has a little bit of a like Napoleon complex. And just this idea that they're, they're going to, they're going to like, they're going to take over the world and like, no, you know, nothing's going to get in their way and nothing's going to stop them. And then there was the assassin one, the one that came in and, tried to kill Sage, which is the one that was in the pool. So it, it evolved naturally out of the story because as the, when they first got to Living Waters, you know, I'm a pantser. So like, I literally like, oh, there's these weird ogre things. Okay, that's cool. Like, and this blade grass, like, and the swirls, like, 
I knew what the swirls were going to be. And if you've ever played D&D, you'll know that there's a creature called a water weird in the old school D&D. And the the sea tree, the watery beings are a little bit inspired by that. Basically just the idea of this thing that can take any shape was made out of water. And I originally imagined that it would like form into like sword-like shapes and they would like, you know, fucking kill people and shit. But then it turned out to be a little (laughs) bit different because I saw this symbiosis and then I realized that even among these watery beings, there were going to be political divisions that would have, they would have different ideas. So that just happened organically as the story was written. And then in editing, I had to go back and fix the shit that didn't make sense. If they were called water weirds in D and D, is that where weird water came from? Ding 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 ding. I mean, part, <laughs> it's part of where it came from. Also, I, I thought it just sounded cool, like the weird water confluence. Like it kind of has a ring to it. But yes, that's meant to be a tip of the hat to old school D and D people who know what a water weird is. They won't even know what it means <laughs> until they've read it, and they're like, "Oh!" At least hopefully. But I mean, a water weird is not. I don't think it's in contemporary D and D, but it was in the old school D and D. It's it's not in fifth edition. Yeah, I can say it's that. basically just a creature, some sort of like protective spirit that, uh, like you you're exploring a dungeon. There's like a pool of still water, and then the water will just rise up into these shapes and like attack you. And so that that <laughs> image, I've always been obsessed with the image of water taking shapes or things that seem like a substance that are actually a being. I like that idea, and I wanted to write creatures that were not in any way shape or form humanoid but that still had uh, that had intelligence and motivations but that were not really you could never really tell whether they were like you or more different so so your answer to my question was because fuck you that's why (laughs) (laughs) you just reminded me of uh one of my favorite poems that i ever wrote which was called the reprobate poem, which was published in the literary magazine of my college of which I was the editor. And the poem goes as follows. You say you got problems. Well, maybe you do, but fuck you anyway. (laughs) That was the entire poem. So yeah, pretty much fuck you anyway, Lily. Yeah. Well, thank you. (laughs) So it it bothered you that that, that, that some of them were evil? No, 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 no. It just felt, um, sudden i think yes well one of one of the one of the fairly reasonable critiques i read in one of the reviews was that the the antagonist was not built up for long enough and so it was a little bit for some anticlimactic which i i accept as a as a legit perspective i don't think i agree with that i so reading it you know we find out that a lot of the actions of of the dooney of the water swirls that we had seen earlier we're leading up to this the whole time. I just had no idea what was going on because Dooney meant nothing right. to me because I was a complete newbie to this world. So I think in retrospect, quite a bit was leading up. I just had no way of picking up on those hints as a first time reader. And so it felt very surprising. I think this is one of those books where you really have to reread it yeah, in order to get all of the nuance. And, and to see what is going on, like, from the beginning. Like, the hints are there, but yeah. you're not going to recognize them until you actually have gotten to the end and know what's right. Right. Well, coming. I often think about a reader, like, how much are they going to remember? Are they going to remember that there was a paint, an ink factory, and then there was an ink boat, and then there was red ink things being put into the water? Like, everything points to red and points to ink, but, like, it's a while before you get the connection to quicksilver and and mercury etc so i i never know so i feel like sometimes i feel like it's so obvious everyone's going to see this and they're going to be like this is such a simple ass book and then other times like no nobody's going to fucking get it and they're going to be like what the hell are you even talking about so yes it's weird writing books i got it by the point you spoon fed it to me (laughs) but yeah i i didn't understand the connection between a red dyes and Quicksilver until the characters said, and it turns out Quicksilver is used in red dyes. And I was like, oh, it all makes sense now. Yeah, I don't even know how. Like, I got the idea. I love the idea of Quicksilver. And I've always been fascinated with Mercury, the way it's the way it looks. And knowing that there was going to be a little bit of alchemy, I was like, oh, we can mix this in. And if you think about Mercury, like liquid Mercury and the sea tree kind of have similar characteristics and that they're both liquid but that takes kind of a weirdly shapely well not shapely but you know what I mean <laughs> I mean I suppose the sea tree could take a shapely form but they don't really yeah it could be 
if they really yes. wanted to. That's a whole different type of invasion. <laughs> Maybe someday <laughs> someone will write Citri fanfic. Something that I was surprised about, and I think this is mostly because I've been on Twitter a lot, is that when Padia came up, and again, this is a comment, not really a question. So I don't, know, I don't know how much, how much of a response you'll have. But when when Padia was mentioned, I was expecting her to to like be part of the book afterwards, and she was not because she's a character in Isle, and. Again, I don't know where I'm going. You were expecting because you've seen the hype. Yeah. So part of the idea, part of the idea of the confluence is that you have two stories that meet at certain points. And there are, you know, there are Mm -hmm. like two main points where Patia or Padia, uh, and your pronunciation is more accurate. I noticed in the podcast that I listened to today, you correctly put the emphasis on the syllable containing the root word, where in English we actually put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. You're good about that. I actually think that it's less that and more that I pronounce it. The, I pronounce everything the way that I would if it was Japanese. Okay, well, may, there's something accurate in that. I feel like there was a question that Sarah asked that I didn't quite, I don't know if I actually answered it. Yeah, so the idea for it is, you know, a confluence is where two rivers come together, was that there would be these little points. And originally it was when I realized that it was going to be not just a book, but two books, I wanted them to be fully independent, but it just didn't work out that way. And I want to also say, and I apologize to Sarah specifically, like, I feel terrible about the fact that the first book is totally different. (laughs) The second book is like a different genre, other than the fact that it has no swords. And I set up a relationship that really is. But it has the other kind of swords. (laughs) Yes. It it does have a lot of the other kind of swords. But I mean, I feel bad because I set up a relationship between Gilia and Temi that's just started at the end of the first book. And to read about it, you have to read about the second book and the happy end that they get, I think, I hope is very appropriate to the kind of relationship that they had. But in order to read yes. it, you also have to read a bunch of like nasty sex shit. So <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't say yes. nasty sex shit. I just say there's a right. lot of for, sex. For, so, for some readers who might want to read the second half of Temi and Gilia's story, they wouldn't like it because it has that. And I felt I wish that I had been able to somehow do it differently because I feel like I know certain readers who probably won't read it, who probably would enjoy seeing the way that Temi and Gilly end up, but they won't. And that's fine because I'm the one who screwed up. So to loop back to my question about sequels, do you hide all of the fun sex in the sequels (laughs) to trick people into buying them? No, actually, uh, in both cases, it was an accident. In the case of the archive, (laughs) I knew that there was going to be... I did not know that the archive was, I knew that the relationship that develops at the end of Hollow Road was going to continue. I did not know how it was going to continue. I did not realize that there was going to be a a mystical surrogacy. And when I realized there was going to be a mystical surrogacy, I certainly didn't know how that was going to play out. So it it surprised me as well. And when it started happening, I started writing it. First of all, I was like, oh, fuck, how do I write this scene? Because I I can just tell you how many times I rewrote that mystical surrogacy scene in the archive, like a (laughs) thousand times. But fortunately, I had good editors and Arena helped a lot as well. But I, it's like I'm powerless. And then the weird thing is the third book has nothing. Like the third book, The Place Below, has like bagel. Well, don't say no, that. No, I mean, it has a lot. I'm saying it's not, <laughs> it doesn't have that. It's very different. So I feel like I, <laughs> I, I feel like in some ways I might be doing a disservice to the readers because I am providing books that are wildly different in some ways. But on the other hand, it's kind of my brand, I guess, at this point. So I'm just going to go with it. I would say as a reader, I tend to appreciate it when intimate moments make sense and they're not there just for the heck of it. So I mean, and it it didn't feel like the scenes between Patia and her paramour were just for titillation. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The fact that right. you're yeah. not doing I, I this... love the word paramour, by the way. <laughs> The fact that they they turn out this way because that's how the story is supposed to go instead of for fulfilling genre conventions, I think ends up being much more compelling. Right. When speaking of genre conventions, I'm I mean, I'm kind of trying to just chuck them out the window as far as I can. And I had a lot of interesting conversations with my editors when I was writing The Isle of a Thousand Worlds in relation to, you know, the nature of the story and the nature of the main character and a lot of change. And I think in in the end, it turned out pretty well because Patia had a very, uh, a very like horny edge 
that kind of permeated every part of her POV. And one of my editors was like, I think we need to see a little bit more of her motivation. And the other editor was like, I fucking hate her. She's why is she like this? <laughs> she shouldn't be like this. Um, and between those two and, and other readers, I kind of figured out that the issue was all the horniness was blinding anyone reading it to the other parts of her personality, which were there, but you could, it's like a, a, one light is so bright that you can't see all the other ones. So in editing, I pulled a lot of that back. And obviously in the like sexy scenes, like she's horny, but she's not like horny all the time as she was originally in earlier drafts. And there were many, many iterations. Well, that was fucking brutal. The editing of that book was the worst <laughs> goddamn experience. Oh my God, but it's done. I think it worked out. I mean, I yes, there were a lot of sex scenes. Yes, for my personal taste as a low sex reader unless i'm specifically in the mood for it i probably would have been okay with less i think that it all worked and it didn't fail not like nothing felt extraneous right well part of what i wanted i mean part of the reason that i let it go the way i did i mean i would say first of all i have to admit that part of it uh part of that blame goes to the likes of crystal and connor who were like <laughs> their 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 words in the discord are like do it coward <laughs> So, so like if you ever, I mean, yes. If you ever, if you ever ask yes. a question, like, is it okay if I do blank? Like, do it, shut up, just do it, um, which is fine. But also, like, I was like, I'm just going to like, let it all hang out, so to speak, in the draft and, and let the chips fall where they may and like, do whatever I need to do in editing. And then when it came out, and I reached out to, to a writer, I know Susan Hancock, uh, who's read my other books and is an absolutely delightful person. And, and she had been, ever since I'd been talking about it on Twitter, she's like, she's like, can I, can I get a, can I get a copy? Can I get a copy? Can I get a copy? And I was like, yes, you can. So I gave, so I gave her, she offered to beta read it. And I actually, I actually, she had mentioned that she wanted it, but I, I reached out because she's a, a, a similar age to Patia. And I wanted to make sure that my depictions of sex scenes among older characters, cause I'm 51, I'm not quite as old there in their sixties, you know, were accurate and, and or appropriate and she read it and she was like she's like absolutely yes like I, I i never see this in a book and i'm very excited to see it so that also was a big factor but some of the other aspects of her personality and the like in the original draft she was much more like visually like seeing male characters and lusting over them and a lot of that got swept away in editing and, and i mean and by me so but on the suggestion of my of my editors and i think it actually ended up making it better because originally I think she was kind of all edge and I tried to pull it back to where she had some edge, but was not all edge. So I don't know how well that played out, but that's, that was part of the process and it was grueling. Yeah. I, I mean, from a personal perspective, I think that if she had had more edge, it would have overshadowed all of the other aspects of her personality. Yeah. Whereas this let everything kind of shine. Um, I'm glad to hear that. But I, I think I think I've, I feel comfortable saying in its general spiciness, it does include some alchemical enhancements, some like creams and oils and mixtures. And I'm going to read it. You don't have to keep convincing me. <laughs> there's, there's a vibrator yes. in there. I was, I was, I was, I'm very, I was sold. Very, very proud of that uh, device. Uh, and I have something even more interesting in the next book. <laughs> do this to me your next book's not out yet i can at least i can read right, the this next one, one is 2023 <laughs> oh that's not fair <laughs> Well, we challenged our guest today with coming up with his very own words are weird and we have absolutely no idea what we have in store for us so dan take it away I have two today. The first one, words of words are weird. I decided to get a little bit meta and let's talk about the word weird because it's a pretty weird fucking word, right? You guys haven't already done words weird, have you? On a previous, okay, I didn't we think have, so. We have not. No. So I, I didn't no. know where it came from. First of all, it breaks that whole I before E except after C bullshit, which I know we all know <laughs> is not really true. So, so listen to this, circa 1400, having power to control fate coming from the old English word weird, W-Y-R-D, fate, chance, fortune, destiny, or the fates, capital F. As in Weird Sisters by Terry Pratchett. 
which we have Mm -hmm. covered on the podcast. Right. Yeah. So we get into later the sense of uncanny or supernatural developed from Middle English use of weird sisters for the three fates or Norns in Germanic mythology, the goddesses who controlled human destiny. Uh, And obviously we have that in uh, the Scottish play and especially 18th and 19th century versions of it. So I thought it was interesting, the idea that weird comes from the idea of fate or chance or fortune. It's not at all what I expected the origin to be. I don't know exactly what I expected. I never be. realized the word weird was so feminine, like in that way, right? The, like the fates oh, yeah, that are always that. like feminine figures. Yeah. What do you know about the, the Norns in Norse mythology? Nothing. Nothing? I can't remember <laughs> who the Norns are. I suppose I could Google it, but... Norse is not my specialty. I know that the, the Norns, they're the weavers of fate, I believe, okay. and they cut cut threads. So the exact fucking same thing? Okay. Yeah, that sounds yeah. about right. <laughs> Am I not supposed to say that? Too bad, I'm not cutting it. I am the weaver of this podcast. <laughs> I mean, and I could I could be completely mistaken because I haven't looked things up, and I have a history of being wrong when I don't look things up. But yeah, well, it's also f- it's also fun to think about w- the idea of weird versus bizarre versus strange. Like, how do we describe things that are different in very certain specific ways? Uh, I just find it all fascinating. So that's my my first words are weird, and I have one more, which is uh, the word mare in folklore, which is where the mare cycle comes from and this is related to the movie gothic which you will be watching at some point <laughs> very which soon lily, if i have yes. anything to say about lily, lily will definitely will be, be watching, watching it at some point a mare old english m-a-e-r-e with the a and the e elided together i don't remember what that's called it's been a while since i studied old english is a malicious entity in germanic and slavic fol- folklore that rides on people's chests while they sleep bringing on nightmares and actually the word nightmare is related oh it's a it's a paralysis demon. It's a sleep paralysis demon. I didn't realize that there was an E at the end of it originally. Yes. So so I studied Old English in college and, or in grad school. And I was coming up with the name of these, you know, mysterious beings. And I felt like that was a word I had seen or heard, like somehow it was a thing, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. So I just kind of went and I looked, I looked up a little bit. I was like, oh, it's an Old English like bugbear or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so I felt like it was kind of, it kind of, it kind of sounds a little bit like werewolf since the mare are hairy, or it might be like man and something else. And then there's a whole idea of nightmare. So that's where the word mare comes from in case anyone was ever wondering. And if you see, if you, if you Google mare, M-A-R-E folklore on Wikipedia, there's a picture of this like creepy little demon sitting on a uh, woman's chest <laughs> and in the movie Gothic there is a there's this type of character exists of course it takes place with mary shelley and and uh the percy bishy shelley and what's his nuts <laughs> lord byron byron <laughs> yes it's basically it's, I, think, his nuts? I think that's the perfect way to refer to lord byron <laughs> and i also think he would appreciate it's it. the story of how she came up with the idea of frankenstein or it's a fictionalized version of it oh yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, it's all kind of like weird and sexy and, and like big hair in an 80s kind of way. But it's, it's kind of <laughs> fun. So, yes, those are my words are weird for today. Words are W-Y-R-D. Yes, they are. You promised us that you had a big confession and you couldn't tell us in advance yes. because we would kick you off of the podcast. I so, have a guess. Okay, go ahead. It's time to come clean. Go ahead, Lily. What's your guess? I think you have either not read Lord of the Rings or dislike Lord of the Rings. Untrue. I have read it several times and I love it. Okay. That was the only thing I could think it's, of that I would boost someone it's actu- for. It's actually worse. So my confession is that as much as I appreciate, respect, value, cherish everything that both the writer themselves and also the fans of said writer bring into the world. And as much as I enjoy hearing you guys talk about said writer and happily. It's a, it's a wheel of time. It's a no, wheel of time. No, it's, it's Terry, Terry Pratchett. Pratchett. It's Terry, oh, it's Pratchett. Terry Pratchett. <laughs> I, I love listening to you talk about Terry Pratchett. I've read a couple, but it's not my flavor of tea at all. And I feel terrible because I know that Terry Pratchett's a genius and his fans are amazing. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, <laughs> we can no longer associate with you. You know, it, this is the end of our relationship. I just felt like we needed to, I needed this to come it. clean at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love uh, you. The way you talk about Terry Pratchett is actually one of the reasons that I enjoy the podcast because it brings out all of your enthusiasm and your argumentative side, and you have many hilarious things to say. But I just had to say that that because I felt like it, you know, it's a confession, and I'm sorry. But I love Terry Pratchett fans, and I have the, nothing but the utmost respect for Terry Pratchett and his genius. I just personally, it's not my flavor of tea. So there's my confession. Not all books work for all people. Exactly. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. And follow us wherever your podcasts live. Thanks again for listening. And may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.